So it was one year ago this week when I realized the porch needed to be repaired. The front porch had been drooping more and more and more and I hired a couple of guys to do a repair. Once they got into it, I realized the repair wasn't enough. It needed to get completely wiped off the house and rebuilt and that's when I decided to do it. I live in a rural area in upstate New York and you know, everybody with a hammer actually does not know what they're doing, unfortunately. I decided let's rip the porch completely off start from scratch and that's what we did and obviously the construction that was here from at least 100 years before was insufficient probably worked well at the time but over the years the the roof and the porch drooped several inches you can in fact see once i leveled it up the paint line there when i leveled up the roof it quite literally lifted the roof up we have porch poles on order from Century Porch Post. They'll be here in a few weeks. By then we'll have a new front porch screen door out of wood. All this stuff will be painted. This whole front porch renovation led to what we're doing inside this whole front of the house. And I'll show you that at the end of the video. I open up the beginning of recording here showing the repair. The repair was not enough to save this deck. You'll see here, this was all happening while I was busy filming the television show down in the yard. And you could see the deck that was put on hundreds of years ago, 150 years ago. I really have no idea. But through all the generations of people I know that lived here, they said they don't ever remember it being changed. And you could see how bad it was rotted. So I knew it was time. The repair wasn't enough. and. Now it's my friend Brooke pulling off the the boards for uh, the original porch. I hated having to do this. I really wanted to save the original porch, but there was just so many little n spots of rot. That little skinny pole I put on 15 years ago when I got the house, we've considered making this little set of stairs up. But Taylor and I looked back at everything and we said, this has to go. We have to start from scratch. It was painful to make that decision because I knew I wasn't going to have the time or the manpower to get in there and get this done in just a few weeks. I knew this was gonna be a really long-term project just because of the schedule. I was working on the television show for several months and in between I started this and then I knew this was gonna be a year-long project. So this is just about 10 months of work you see in this entire video. Hey guys, we're releasing a new bundle. If you buy an ice pick, it comes with three woodworking plans. That would be the two draw toolbox that I made several years ago, my classic toolbox with the handle that we sell currently at Walmart, and the classic toolbox with the bottom drawer, if you saw that video a year ago. So if you're looking for some really cool things to do, some woodworking plans, please check out this bundle. And then once you're done building one of the three toolboxes, you can keep your Duresta ice pick in there. This bundle will only be available for a limited time, so please click the link in the description below. And as always, thank you for your love and support. Here you can see I saved all of the porch planks and we are turning them into this boat. Once I mill that wood down, it all comes out to these nice shapes. I probably won't need nearly as many as I have, but you can see the, the boat is well underway. This video will be out at the end of the summer. This beautiful fur rips up really nice. It's really old growth. It's got long, multiple straight grain. And I didn't know what I was going to do with all these porch planks. I saved them. I didn't right away know I was going to make the boat, but I saved them because I just knew underneath all that lead paint and discoloration, we were going to have some nice wood. So here you see the aftermath of the rip out. You could see the rotted planks are completely gone. The rotted uh, stringers are all gone. These are two by like two by fives made in a sawmill. And you could see then that like 24 inches on center and the, uh, the opposing ones are every eight, 10 feet. So now I remove the porch poles. I thought honestly, I was gonna save these porch poles. I still saved them. I didn't throw them away, but after looking at the bottoms of them and the fact that they are quite literally covered with tens of coats of paint, maybe 15 coats of paint, I decided Let's just do the whole thing over. I'm almost tempted to do the whole underside of the tongue and groove over, but I don't want to get too crazy because again, there's just not enough skilled manpower up here available. It's not even, I'm not worried about the, the price of it. I just can't find people to do it. All right, the interesting thing about this is that there are no posts genuinely corresponding with where they're holding the porch up. So the posts on the ground were just randomly placed along the stringer. 
and where the support fell randomly maybe fell on top of it or next to it or near it you can see these are just tree stumps these are all going to get pulled out and where there's a corresponding column we'll put a sonar tube and we'll put cement This is one of the contractors we hired, his lame attempt, when he didn't immediately do what I did and support the roof and rip the deck apart. I knew he didn't know what he was doing, so I asked him to leave. It's the first thing he started doing the day one. He started digging a hole for a, a post. The front fascia board began to rot and had a couple of guys do just a quick repair. I had these guys do a quick repair and then it was pretty evident that it wasn't going to look good and everything else needed to be replaced so this is a couple days worth of work and then I came after the TV show one day and looked and I just said the whole thing has to be redone let's stop so that's why we're here where we are I'm going to use that that I redid I did this over about six years ago because this whole entire deck right here was completely rotted and gone so I'm gonna replace everything from here over all the way around to the other side it was interesting to tear apart this deck and see how they would have built it I'm guessing this was built in the 20s just based on the fact that it's all cut nails and I saved all this wood I kept it all even with the nails and everything I don't know what I'm gonna do with it but these locusts poles that were used as the foundation I would unbelievably not rotted uh, completely away and I used my side by side to pull this up and out you see by resting it up and over that 2 by 4 you change the direction of force I was able to pull that right up and out that was like my third attempt but look at the bottom of that that's been buried for a hundred years and you could see the foundation of the house there is in brick now this house is 230 years old, but there's been some major, major renovations on this house over the years. In fact, some of the wood we found inside the walls has burn marks on it, which lead me to believe that it was either recycled from a burn house, or maybe this house burned at one point. We did find a big timber in the house with charring on it. And uh, now this is, you'll notice in that last segment where I actually talked, I said, Right where there's a porch pole, I'm going to put, I'm going to put down a, a cement column. So right where there's evidence of the porch pole, I'm hanging a string, and I'm going to put a little weight at the bottom. And now this is one of the when the guys were, were trying to do the repair in the beginning of the summer. So put a, a weight, just a a one inch nut at the bottom of each one of those strings. So right where that lives in space, I'm going to dig a hole, put a sonar tube, and put a concrete pillar. And I do like the spacing of the poles. So I'm going to do, you see how there's one and the pole was right next to it. And here's another little trick if you're trying to pull something out of the ground. Just throw a chain around it and you could lever it up with a big pry bar. Make sure hips. Loosen it up, whack it a few times, and then get your leverage on there, and there you go, I'm pulling that up out of the ground. And again, these must be hard locust poles. I'm really surprised how much they are not rotted. And they were only in the ground, just a foot, which was crazy to me because the heave in the winter is just unbelievable here. You put anything in the ground. My frost line, you have to be below 48 inches. And we manually dug i used the drill from harbor freight just to loosen the dirt up but it didn't do much i still had to pull out a considerable amount of dirt out of the holes and i have such a high water table here once we started digging down the holes started filling with water it's like being at the beach also we, there was some heavy rains in between so 
the holes started filling up with water from the rain and then also just always had a steady bit of water at the bottom of them. And uh, I started mixing by hand and uh, since there was so much water in the bottom of the holes, I was just using a bucket to get the water out. And we began to mix with all the rain water. And I actually did eventually get a cement mixer from Harbor Freight, which turned out to be really good. But I, I mixed by hand for a couple days and then I went and got the, the mixer. But having the string and the bolt was really good. So here's me just getting water out of the hole. I just use a little cup and a string to get all that rain water, some of the water from the earth out of there. Now, to be perfectly honest, I can't recall me ever doing this. I don't think I've ever mixed concrete in my life. I know there's lots of YouTubers doing concrete. I can't ever remember mixing concrete before this. I might have. I just, I've lived a pretty long life. I just can't remember doing it in the past. Taylor's always played with concrete, so she's always mixing it. I just, to me, it's just such a dirty job. And there you go. And then I end up putting, I learned this from r, r Builders, it doesn't matter what's happening at the bottom of the hole, it's the top of the hole that looks sexy. So you just throw, you don't have to throw that sonar tube all the way to the bottom of the hole. You just want to fill that bottom up, that mushroom cap underneath, and then fill the top up. And this way you have a nice finished look up and out of the ground. And that's really obviously what matters. Again, making sure that I have a column right over each tube. And then here you have the cement mixer, and there's Ryan's giving me a hand. And the cement mixer actually worked really, really, really well. It's only maybe, maybe not even 100 bucks, which is unbelievable to me. I don't understand how they could make these things so cheap. There you go. Make sure I'm over the hole. Looking good. There's no doubt about it, this is really grueling work. But it's good mental exercise, it's good physical exercise. <clears throat> this is the type of work I used to do when I was in college or when I was at art school for money. I haven't done this sort of hard, hard labor in a really long time. When I was doing interior design, honestly, that wasn't that hard. This is hard work, so respect to everybody that does this type of hard work on the regular. I always try and get people to, to do this stuff for me. And in this case, I took it as a challenge. I was like, might make a good video. And also I'll learn a thing or two about a thing or two. And uh, I really did. I really did enjoy it. It was, it was fun. But I'm certainly glad I'm almost over with it. Now the construction begins uh, once the TV show left. Now it's like July. When the TV show left, they left a lot of lumber and a lot of material that I used to cut up and use for the port. So a lot of the stuff was wider than I needed, so I was just splitting it down. And the first thing I felt that I needed to do was to add the stringer on the house. And I have to be sure that I leave enough room from the bottom of the clapboard to the top for the eventuality of putting the top of the deck on. I'm gonna use one inch boards, which ultimately ended up being about seven eighths. And uh, a battery nailer comes in really handy in this case. And I have a pretty healthy sill plate, but you can see right there, closest to the camera, right where I just covered it with the, with the level. A lot of the timbers in this house are recycled. There's pockets in all the timbers for some strange reason. There's a pocket there, there's another pocket there, and there's nothing interacting with it. So I think a lot of this house is made out of recycled wood. And uh, here you could see now I'm beginning to lay out, I think I did eight foot, no, 10 foot sections. So I'm marking out the perpendicular, uh, forgive me for not knowing the names of all these different types of stringers, but they come perpendicular off the house and then they carry the, uh, the two by eights that come in between them and you'll see what I'm doing. So I thought it best to lay everything out, come directly off of the house and then put the edge on it. And that's my, that's my turkey hen, just having fun. Animal break, that's Junior. And that's the section that I built about seven or eight years ago. 
I kept that and I just carried on from there. And now these are all the timbers that are come, gonna come directly off the house. And I just economized my workflow by just cutting through everything at the same time. A lot of these, again, were left over from the TV show. Believe it or not, they bought all kinds of crazy material for the TV show. And I just was, uh, it was perfect timing. I was able to use a lot of it. And in my opinion, it's best to cut all these at the same time, get everything that needs to be the same length cut at the same time so I don't make any accidents and make mistakes down the road. Because I'm really good at that. I'm really good at making mistakes and inverting numbers and cutting a piece and so just always using that same timber as my my pattern and then just coming off of that and using that each time and here you see I'm, I'm laying them out and they're going to come directly off the house and then in between them is going to be all the timbers that are going to be parallel to the house and I'm keeping everything 16 on center if you remember the beginning of the video everything was about 24 on center and because I was working alone most of the time, these little things help, little tricks like that. And I put that little shelf underneath, and you could see. And then uh, for those of you who remember, I made these little tiny horses for uh, the build of all the, the bullet bourbon trailers. So I'm using them. I'm letting them fly out in space and getting everything nailed into position. I eventually break off those little ledgers and then put hangers. For me, it was easier to build it, then put all the hangers in after, as opposed to trying to lay out all the hangers to begin with. Because what I would find sometimes with the hangers is that uh, you nail them in and then you go to put the wood in and they're not nailed in appropriately and you can't get your, the end of your two by in there because they're pinched too tight. Now you see I'm also using a story stick to lay out my 16 on center. I'm just coming off the house and I'm just using a piece of wood that has my markings on it. And this way I don't make any mistakes. I read the ruler as little as possible. And now here you see me installing hangers, but I'm using a piece of scrap to make sure that when I go to put the end of the two by in there, it fits. So I am nailing them in ahead of time, but I'm using a piece of scrap to make sure that I, I space them appropriately. And now I'm putting the very first one in, or rather the one closest to the, uh, to the rim joist, just because I'm trying to establish each one of those boxes, make them square and perpendicular and parallel and everything else. And now with all the ends tied together, I can begin to level everything and now everything is is level across but it is slanted down from the house by a few degrees and now here I'm starting to nail in the fascia board which you'll see how I began to put the fascia board together it is staggered with multiple pieces because the original deck I noticed that fascia board was all disconnected so I double layered it and overlapped the seams and then I ultimately bolted it and of course I bolted it right wherever there was a leg so you'll see I kind of did overkill but I just wanted this to last at least another hundred years and uh, you could see here that is the corner I let things run long just to make sure that everything ended up being nice and square and that whole rim edge, whatever you want to call it, rim joist, whatever the hell it's called, that outer all gets double layered two by eights, all bolted together. Now I got to do that long joist that comes out of the corner and into the inside corner. And I could have set up the circular saw, but for me it was easier to hand cut it. Once I knew what the angle was, by cutting it by hand, I have more control and I can make a deeper cut. I wouldn't have been able to make that with a circular saw. It's a real severe cut. And you'll see where that goes. And it's also good to practice just using your hand saw. Just so you know when you need it, you're good at it. 
to a job like this, I hand sawed a lot of it. You'll see me hand saw the edge of the deck later and you'll be wondering why I'll explain that. So here we go. And you'll see where that goes. Oh, I'm cutting another one. Now this is interesting. So this is, there's some really long joists that come out of the corner. And this is one of them that was really long. And this was a two by 10 and I was using two by eights everywhere. So I kept the two by 10, but right where it comes to the edge of the deck, I cut it back up a little bit. So I made it a two by eight for the last 12 or 13 inches. So I kept the strength of all of it and just let, made the end reveal to be what it needs to be. And here you'll see where those go in place. And you could see how I cut the ends back a little bit. I kept the girth and that, and that was because that was the material I had. If I was gonna go buy them, I probably would have just bought long two by eights. But I said, since this is the longest section and why not use the, the strength? And there you could see it again, what I was talking about. Clap it together and everywhere where there was a section, I had a timber on each end of the section. So you get the, the double strength at each end. Now this is the other corner, which is also super, super long, much longer than that front one, because this part of the deck here coming off the house uh, where Ryan is, is about 11 feet. The front of the house is seven feet and the other side is six feet. So it was very tricky to try and figure out how to level all that and also keep the pitch. We had to fudge some of it. So if you're coming off the house, uh, six feet in one section, seven feet in another section, and 11 feet in another section, the pitch has to change. And so I was able to fudge it so it kind of all blended and you don't notice it nearly as much. And considering the house is old, there are lots of things that aren't straight and probably never will be straight. Now you see me just going into the sill plate with timber locks. So I put timber locks everywhere. The entire deck, the entire front porch was held to the house with just three inch nails, three inch steel cuts everywhere. Now you, you see me and Ryan, Ryan teaching Ryan how to use the saw. Those severe angles, I, I don't know how else you would have done them unless you've done them by hand. And uh, we're nailing everything in place and then we come back and put all the hangers in like I was saying before. Which was good timing because I found online, I found on Instagram, I saw Kyle using the metal connector from Metabo and I reached out and then they sent me one. So here you see me bolting. I'm bolting to the old construction that I had there. I just came out a couple more inches. And so we're bolting to the old construction and it's kind of hard to get your bearings where everything is, but all these bolts really give it the strength. I was really overkilling. I was really afraid. I didn't want to have to do this again, not in my lifetime. And so now you can see it really coming together. Mike is putting in all of the hangers and now Mike is putting in all those little cripplers. I forget exactly what those are called, but that keeps everything from twisting. And it was a good way of us using up all the scrap. But in a few minutes, you'll see me using the metal connector nailer from Metabo, which came in really handy. It has a, a little point on it that you sit in the metal connector nail hole and it sets the nail right where the point is. Now these are all just the, uh, the cripplers, so these don't necessarily need to have the metal hangers on them. The metal hangers go wherever the joist is actually carrying the weight. I said this was a way also to use up a lot of the scrap. And there's the metal connector I was talking about. You just put the tip right in the hole and it lands a nail right in there. Now I tried a couple of different ways to put the, the, uh, the legs in place here. And the first one I, I used the cement glue, but then I started just actually using tap cons and going directly into the cement. And that's a, a six by six. And I found it easier to just cut them by hand. I know a lot of guys would cut it three sides or two sides or four sides and then hand saw it. It was just easy for me to just hand saw it. And like I said, just more practice. Now here I use cement glue, but this is the only time I did this. This seems, seemed a lot, seemed fairly wasteful. And those old jacks came in really handy. 
I use them everywhere. Like I said, this was the only time I did this from, from this point on. And that's because I had that weird corner, those three things converging together. So that's why I didn't end up having that come up through and bolt to the fascia. Now here, I decide to go backwards and actually tap con it in place. And I add one tap con and then I drill right through the metal plate with the tap con drill without a problem. And then I just tap con that in place. Now I'm able to nail it, hammer it in place, get it all level. And then with the metal connectors, just throw the nails in place. So this might be the opposite corner. I forget where I am here. Yeah, that's up underneath the other corner with all the material in the corner. There's one bolted into position. And now every other one, I cut back the width of one two by. And so it's resting directly on it and bolting to it. You can see what I've done there. Now this is the majority of them. They're done like this. And there you go. So you got some really good added strength. And the metal connector from Metabo throws the nails right where I need it, level it up, clamp it, and then throw some lags right through everything. I definitely went to school on all of this because, again, this isn't the type of work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the type of work I like to hire people to do because they do it better than me. And now that everything is coming together, I really started to see the vision. And I was actually happy that I decided to do this on my own. Because I really, uh, it really becomes rewarding once you get past the hump. You know, the whole time you're, you're thinking to yourself, why did I decide to do this? Or why did I start this project? But when you start to see some results, it, it really helps. And, you know, you just got to kind of have faith in yourself and faith in your work and, and just get past that bump. Yeah, there was a lot of times I was on this project where I just really wished that I could have somebody else do it, but obviously, here we are. And this is what I was talking about, getting those hangers up in there. And that metal connector really came in handy. And that's, that's what it's called if you were to look it up, the metal connector. I'll put a link to, uh, to their website. And now, finally, I'm able to use all these old jacks that I had right on top of each one of the legs and stand the porch back up and get rid of those, uh, what are that? what are those, like those two by six jacks that I had slid into place to hold the porch up while I was working. You'll see us be able to knock out those. Every time I see these old school jacks, I buy them. And the reason why, because unlike a hydraulic jack, you can adjust them. You can jack up a hydraulic jack, but you can't lower it. You can lower it. I mean, you can lower it, but by screwing it and then unscrewing it, you could move it in increments of an inch. The hydraulic jack, you go up, but to come down, you might come down too fast. You run the risk of loosening it too quickly. And now, finally, we're ready for our deck top. And we use Red Granger or Eucalyptus. There's a synonymous names for this particular material. All prepared by my friend John here at First Cut. And this is his facility and he prepared all this wood. He buys it in stock and then he puts the tongue and groove and the finish on each one of these pieces. Unbelievable. And the magic of watching him come through the door of his place is just incredible. Those were up to 16 feet long and weren't able to get exactly what I needed as far as all the lengths, but so I had to cut them up. So I had to cut up and do my math. I had to take all the short ones and figure out where each half was going to go and all the long ones and figure out where each half was going to go. And so here we put them on my trailer. And that's all the wood that I used for the deck. Uh, only like the last maybe four or five feet did I have to piece parts together. But for the most part, every other piece is one long single piece coming straight off the house. Beautiful wood, and uh, it was really, really prepared well by John. Did a nice job. 
And now here I am off-site preparing all of the wood. I made it all just a little bit longer than I needed to, but by preparing it off-site, I was able to keep it out of the rain while I was working on it. Uh, this is another little shop that I rent over near my main shop. And I'm just cutting up and preparing and laying out all the deck lengths I need. And you'll see by splitting a piece in half, I had to really be uh, economical with cutting a short piece and saving the long piece and then making sure I had enough. So it was uh, a lot of math involved, just making sure that I wasn't cutting the pieces where it would leave me long pieces that were just enough, not just not long enough to cover. And here you see exactly what's happening. And I started the tongue and groove. You just tightly pack them. And John, the guy who prepared and knows the wood better than me, said, don't worry about it. And now this is in October and I finally began to lay boards down. And you'll notice how I had to prepare the stringer along the house to give me enough room to go under that last clapboard and everything worked out fine. And uh, you could see that tree that is no longer there. And with a big project like this, I just throughout the year, I just had to make sure I just had to keep moving it along. A little bit of a break here, a little bit of a break there. I just had to make sure I kept moving it along. Working at night. And now when I come to the corner, I have to kind of consider it. And as I was cutting the boards for the different sections, I was laying them in places where they would, they would be. And so and this was my first corner, so I was a little nervous. I wanted to make sure that, again, I was using the wood economically so that I was going to have exactly what I needed when I was done. So I numbered all the boards coming off that corner. I chalked it out on the ground, and I laid them all out, and I numbered them. And here I am putting them in place. And I had to be longer on one end so that I can trim the front edge of the board. And I had to be long enough on the angle so that when I laid down and cut the angle, that looked good as well. And so here it is the next day. I'm laying in. This is like October going into November. And I was a little worried about putting all this wood in in, in the cold and then worrying about it when it got, got nice out. And now I'm ready for the track saw, which is crucial when it comes to making these tight corners and like I said I was worried about putting this all together in October and worrying about once the winter was over if these boards were going to swell but nothing swole, swelled up at all and you'll see by the end of the video which right now it is June June 10th and what you see me doing here is in October and then again that cutoff tool the oscillating tool came in critical right here I don't know how else I would have been able to do that if I didn't have the oscillating tool right there and you can see how well that works and uh, now I'm prepared to go in the other direction. So by doing that one cut, setting the saw, and now I just keep adding. And here is a good way you could see I'm using these deck screws. There's these certain type of deck screws. I don't know what they're called, but you'll see them at Home Depot or Lowe's where the top half inch turns in the opposite direction and pushes the material down. They're pretty interesting. And they have like a T10 top or a T15 top. So they bury their heads in there. At first I was pre-drilling them, but then I realized I didn't have to. So that first run on the six foot side, I was pre-drilling them. And this is my flex volt with the 60 volt batteries, which I was able to use on site. Came in really handy. And now here I'm using up a lot of the scrap that I ended up with when I was doing my initial setup of all the different pieces. Here, I think I'm still pre-drilling. This was before I realized I didn't need to pre-drill. I think I went to a smaller drill or a smaller screw. But just tightly packing them as per John's suggestion. And I wasn't going to be able to make the angle meet the perfect angle on the other board. I wasn't really crazy about that. I, I didn't need to be overly concerned. One thing I did, though, do is when I cut my angle, I cut it back about two degrees so that the top of the the join would kiss. The bottom might have a little gap in it, but that's down inside the deck. No one's going to see it. So uh, in some cases, I threw just a tiny bit of scrap wherever the material was right at the blade cut. I don't know if I ever show that or not. I don't think I do. But like maybe something like the width of a pencil so that the board is leaned up a little bit. So when I make my chop and you take it away from the, the saw blade, it has a beveled back 
to the back angle. So that way the top of the cut will kiss. And then technically speaking, the front of the deck goes down a couple degrees and the side of the deck goes down a couple degrees. So it is a compound angle that comes together. Very slight, but genuinely a compound angle. And this is the type of work that requires endurance. You have to just keep doing it. And every time I sat down, I said to myself, I'm gonna to get to this section. I mark a spot away, maybe eight, 10 feet away from where I began and said, I'm gonna to get to there today. And that was how I was able to put each one of those little sections together and really start to get to the other corner. And then my neighbors, <laughs> Howard's in here. I'm talking to Taylor. Howard just walked up and said hi to me in the video. Howard the gardener. <laughs> All my neighbors would stop and by and, and saying hello while I was working. And uh, the neighbors were happy to see the improvement. My neighbors aren't super close, but when they drive by and I see people down at the milk run, they're impressed with the, the revised deck, which we're very happy with as well. And in the background, you can see Ken Makeley's new step was installed in the interim. And now here, Taylor and I are working together to get another 10 feet of section done. And uh, it's also, it's like picking fruit. You gotta make sure each one of the boards you pick is good, that there's no chips or checks in them. And if they are, you gotta figure out where you're gonna hide those chips and those checks. And uh, Taylor's got the screws closest to the house. I got the screws closest to the edge. And this really made it go quickly when you have two people. Because you gotta keep getting up and out and stepping in and out of those sections. And that's why this is really physical, physical work. It was like running through the tires when you see somebody in the army training running through tires. Every time you walked on the deck where there were no boards, you had to run in and out of the tires. And now here it is a couple of weeks later. You could see the fall has set in quite a bit and I'm working my way to the other corner. And this time I just, I had the confidence to know how to use the material. So I just laid it on there and I didn't have to go to the shop and cut up. Because now I'm way past the middle so I could see how much material I had left. In the beginning I was being super conservative and making sure and making sure and making sure. Now I was in the final stretch. I had to just round that last eight, nine foot section, which that's about 10 by 11 feet. And so here, like I said, I was just confident in knowing I didn't need to lay all these pieces out. And uh, here I am doing my my, my cut, I'm switching the battery, it's always the case, <laughs> looking for a battery. And uh, I actually did a lot of this at night with the, those DeWalt drop lights. They actually worked really well with the 60 volt battery in them. They lasted for a really long time. And they gave me a really nice ambient light. And that's the ambient light that you see there. That's off of those, those DeWalt like safety cone lights. They gave them to me when we, me and Kyle were working on the building together. And uh, I guess I didn't have my saw set deep enough. Oh, there it was. And then having that blower nearby is great. I, bought one, I have those one in each brand. Now, it's really nice looking back and seeing how far I've gotten. It's really nice. Okay, see now we've finally made it to the, the month of May. That was this past May and I lay out lines to finally cut and trim the edge because I did the last five or six feet, finally did the last five or six feet. And I lay a pencil line down, I use a long level and I give myself a line. And I personally found that using the handsaw uh, not only gave me practice, which I'm always looking forward to handsaw, but with the handsaw, every push on the cut was down, and the down cut keeps everything from splintering. You also notice how weathered the deck got over the winter, and you'll see in a couple of cells 
we ended up sanding the whole deck. Taylor got the, the big square pad sander and we sanded the whole deck before we put the linseed oil on and uh, it got rid of any of the weathering stains because we didn't get a chance to put any of the finish on until the springtime. So the deck endured the entire winter. Now here you see Taylor sands the whole deck. It got rid of that layer of oxidation and you don't see any of the rain lines that developed on the unprotected wood. And now we're ready for the linseed oil. Uh, we're gonna put a couple of coats of linseed oil on it. This is the very first coat. This is a, a, a brand that Taylor researched and found the good stuff. And you could see how that wood comes right back to life with that linseed oil on it now. So now we'll, we'll make sure that we keep a healthy coat of linseed oil on it. This whole section of the house was really severely damaged by water, which would run down the outside of the house and damage this whole part of the deck and this whole ceiling here. So this was all repaired and obviously the deck was replaced. I found the source of the leak, which was a broken drain pipe. And uh, the seam on the back of the drain pipe was split going into the clapboard and the bottom was clogged. So when it was a, a rainy day, the water would just gush backwards into the clapboard, dug a hole in the clapboard seam, and just water would go directly. So this whole part of the house has a little bit of damage and we're working on it slowly. You see, I'm glad I found the source before it got too late. Around the same time we started working on the front porch, we have a, a very talented stonemason did, Ken Makeley, he did all this stonework. We had steps put in here. We had steps put in here. And we also had some very dangerous trees removed. These trees were about 100 feet tall, both of them. And I was afraid that they would fall and cause a lot of damage. They were really too close to the house. And a lot of these trees that are well over 100 years old around here are starting to fall. You'll see every now and again, a giant tree just laying on its side in somebody's yard. So before that happened here, we just got rid of them. Unfortunately, I love the cover, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. It's another beautiful set of steps by Ken Makeley. So this whole construction spurred on some interior renovation. Those of you that follow along on Instagram know that Taylor decided to gut this room. And if you go to 1790s farmhouse, on Instagram, I'll link it below. You'll be able to follow some of the before and after pictures here. But this whole room is gutted and we're gonna do proper plaster lath on the walls. And it led to sanding the floors in here, removing all the tens of layers of wallpaper off of here. I gotta repair the plaster in this foyer of the house. And then again, that led to sanding the floors in here ripping out an uh, awkward closet that was placed in there, probably in the 1950s. And so now all the trim is getting its thousands and thousands of coats of paint removed. You get it back down to the original beautiful woodwork, getting rid of the ugly baseboards. So follow along. Part two will probably be out October, November, December for the rest of this. Once the porch poles come in, we get everything painted up, we'll do part two. And there'll be some more house renovation stuff coming up. Thank you for the love and support, and I'll see you soon.